Well, we had to change tapes, but I guess you did too, so I guess there's nothing lost. Uh, let's go on to compaction sheet uh, number uh, five. But compaction sheet number five and five continued shows is a nuclear uh, density apparatus. Uh, five shows it being used where you've got it up in the air, you've got your source of radiation, you've got your detector, and you're uh, letting it uh, backscatter. This is really an inaccurate way to use them. You really shouldn't do that. Sometimes you'd be forced to do it because of circumstances. You can't do any better, but you really don't want to use a, uh, a nuclear density and water content apparatus in this manner. Uh, uh, this slide, five continued, shows another poor way to use it. At least it's on the ground, but you haven't driven the source into the ground. The best way to use this thing is like this, where you drive the source into the ground and the meter is flat on the ground, and then you get uh, uh, dependable and uh, accurate uh, measurements of uh, density and water content. If you end up with an air gap in there and, and you don't know the dimensions of that air gap, you get some uh, some serious uh, serious errors. You also have to correct for geometry. If this is in the bottom of a trench, uh, you get different results and you got to make a, a, a geometry correction. Okay. Uh, I told you when we were talking about the uh, void ratio and the porosity and so on, that there was a way to determine the density in the field using some sand. Uh, suppose that you wanted to go out and sample the sand and you didn't have a thin walled sampler. And what you wanted to do then, uh, you're going to use this, uh, this, this a glass jar with some auto with sand in it. It's got a funnel, it's got a valve, a funnel, and a, and a, a plate. You take all this off, you take a shovel, and you dig a hole. You collect the sample, you put the soil in a, in a watertight container, like a baggie or something wrap it in aluminum foil, put it in a jar, and you'd take that back to the lab and you'd weigh it. So that'd give you the total weight, but you don't know the volume. So then you'd, you'd have this surface smooth before you started digging. You'd put this apparatus up. You've calibrated the sand before you went out there. You open the valve, and sand goes in there and fills up the funnel in the hole, and then you weigh the sand that's remaining in the bottle. You know the weight of the sand before you released it. And the difference is the volume of sand it took to fill up the funnel in the hole. And if it's calibrated, then you know the volume. You've learned, you've measured the volume by filling it with sand. That's, that's one technique. Another technique is very similar. And, uh, and uh, here you use water, though. What you got is a balloon. You dig the hole. You have a smooth plate. You put the pl plate down first. It is smooth. You take the plate off. You take your shovel. You dig out your soil that you're going to weigh. You put the plate back down, and you put the water apparatus on it. You open a valve, and uh, and you measure the water that it takes to fill up that hole. So now you got the volume, and when you weigh the sample, you got the weight. Uh, this next slide is for comic relief. Uh, this is from an old old textbook before the EPA. <laughs> One way to measure that volume is to fill it up with oil. <laughs> And measure that was before the oil embargo, embargo, before the price of oil went up, and before the price of putting oil in the ground went way up. But it's and you could use water. Uh, there are field expedients that you could use, but I doubt that you would use oil. Okay. Well, we've looked at uh, sheet seven, and uh, look at sheet uh, eight. And uh, it's just got some interesting information. We don't have much time. Uh, we only have three hours to cover this. So I just encourage you to read uh, compaction sheets uh, eight and nine and so on. They've got some uh, interesting information in there that you can uh, look at. Uh, sheet number uh, 17, for example, does show the modified proctor and the standard proctor. It shows the zero air voids. It shows the 80% saturated curve and a 60% saturated curve. And so you, if you put in that equation, not 100%, but 80% or 60%, you can calculate the appropriate curves. So you can, uh, you can look at that in your uh, leisure time.
Okay, now the next topic that I want to talk about has to do with permeability. I really don't want to talk so much about permeability as to talk about flow nets. Because occasionally they have some of these problems on the, uh, on the exam. Here we go. Start with sheet one. What I got there is a bucket of water. And I got the floor. And I got a datum plane. And the floor is 20 feet above the datum. The point C in that bucket of water is 12 feet above the floor. Point B is 8 feet above point C. Point A is 5 feet above point B. I got this water in there. And I want to talk about the potential energy in water. And, uh, and I want to do is show you that all the water in that bucket has the same potential energy. Potential energy in water can be expressed in feet, feet of head. And it's normally expressed as feet of elevation, head, and feet of pressure head. And then you add the pressure head and the elevation head together and you get the total feet or the total head. Now then, uh, if you'll find uh, 1B, <laughs> it was there, uh, 1B, and I will put the sketch and the diagram as close together as I can. Yeah, I believe we can see that. And uh, I got the point A, B, and C over here, uh, just off to the left of the screen, but you've got it in front of you. you got sheet 1B and sheet uh, 1A. And, uh, and so point A is 45 feet above the datum. That's 20 feet plus 12 feet is 32 feet plus 8 feet is 40 feet plus 5 feet is 45. So elevation of point A is 45. The elevation point B is 40. The elevation point C is 32. So point A has 40 feet of elevation head. Uh, point B has 40 feet of elevation head. Point A has 45 feet of elevation head. Point C has 32 feet of elevation head. Now then, we ignore atmospheric pressure, but the water pressure at point A is zero. There's no water standing above A, so the water pressure at A is zero. The water pressure at B is 5 feet. B is under 5 feet of water. So I got 5 feet of pressure at, of water pressure at B, and I've got uh, 5 and 8, which is 13 feet of pressure at point C. The total potential energy is 45 plus 0 is 45. 40 plus 5 is 45. 32 plus 13 is 45. Every drop of water in that bucket has the same potential energy. And we're going to take advantage of that fact when we draw a flow net. We're going to take advantage of that bit of knowledge. Okay, now I go to uh, sheet uh, 2A. And it's a little uh, verbal description there. It says, how do you draw a flow net? You draw a flow net by sketching. I don't think I've ever seen a question on the exam that required you to draw a flow net. I think I've seen a question where the flow net was there and you had to use it. But how would you draw a flow net? Well, you draw a flow net by sketching it. And I'm going to show you a complete, and you can read this, but I'm going to give you a, a completed flow net. As, here's a portion of the flow net. You draw it so it squares. Here's uh, uh, you, you think that the water is flowing between along this line, along this line, along that line, and along that line. Here's the total potential energy, the total potential energy, and the total. And uh, the energy is dropping as you go along, but every drop of water along that line has the same potential energy, just like every drop of water in that bucket had the same potential energy. You end up drawing these little squares. It's a square if you can draw a true circle, it's just tangent to the four sides. That would be a square. These look square. I'm going to draw it a little more curved. Here's a curve, here's a curve, here's a curve, and there's a curve. If I could draw a circle in there, that'd be a square. 
it's square because these cross at right angles and it's square because I can draw a circle in there. Okay, so you draw a series of flow lines and you draw a series of heat lines of equal potential. Now, that's a little mystical until we look at a real flow net. So turn to page 3A and we'll look at a real flow net. So here it is. And this is a drawn flow net. Now then, what we've got is some elevations. This water is a 23.5 meters, apparently. Uh, I don't remember when I worked this. Yeah, I worked it in meters. Uh, meters uh, above the datum. Apparently the datum is right here, at zero. It's 17.2 meters, so this point is 17.2 meters above zero. This is an elevation 23.5 meters. Uh, this is an elevation 17.2 meters. This is elevation zero meters. And the water level is here on this side, it's here on this side. So the head, the head loss is the difference between 17.2 and 25.3, which supposedly comes out 6.3 meters. Uh, we have lines of equal potential. Every drop of water in this bucket of water up here, if you visualize this as a bucket of water, every drop of water in this bucket of water has the same potential energy. And what is that potential energy? It's equal to the elevation of the water surface. What's the elevation of the water surface? It's 23.5. So the drop of water right in contact with that line there has a total potential energy of 23.5 meters. Every drop of water in this reservoir, which has a real thin, you know, it's, not sta it's standing at the water surface, uh, has a potential energy of 17.2. The potential energy drops from 23.5 meters to 17.2 meters as the water flows from here to here. It drops 6.3 meters. So this is a line of equal potential. This is a line of equal potential. The equal the potential is 23.5. The potential here is 17.2 uh, 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 meters. This is a line of equal potential. This line of equal potential. All these are lines of equal potential. And we can figure out what the potential energy is for each one of these in a minute. Okay, now I want flow lines. A flow line, water flows through the soil between flow lines. Now then, this represents one flow line. There's a flow line. It's just the base of the dam. A drop of water right there would flow right in contact with that dam all the way around and come up at the other end. This is a flow line. Water way up here at infinity would go down and get to the bottom of the channel, flow along that bottom and come up down here somewhere at infinity. This is another flow line, and this is another flow line. I can number these. There's one, two, three flow channels. There's three, like, pipes for the water to flow through. This is one pipe, this is one pipe, this is one pipe. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines of equal, uh, ten equal uh, drops in equal potential. The potential is going to drop 6.3 meters as the water flows through the soil. According to my flow net, it's going to do it in 10 uh, even increments. It's going to drop 0, 6.3 divided by 10. It's going to drop 0 0.63 meters per square. When the water flows from here to here, the potential energy is no longer going to be 23.5. It's going to be 23.5 minus 6.3 divided by 10. Okay? So the first thing you do is compute the elevations. The second thing you do is number the flow channels. There's three. And the next thing you do is number the drops of energy. And there's 10. We go on to the next sketch, 3B. What we're going to do is figure out what to label these lines of equal potential. I've already shown you how to do this. The water surface here is a 23.5. So the water in contact with this line has a potential of 23.5. The water here has a potential of 17.2. Uh, let's go around forward. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9 and 10. We got 10 equal steps in potential energy. We're going to lose 6.3 meters. So we're losing 0 0.63 meters uh, of head loss uh, every time it goes through a square. So from here to here, we're going to gain 0 0.63 meters. So this is 17.2. This is 17.83. This is 18.46, which is 17.83 plus 63. And so I can calculate this for every one of them ends up closing back on 23.5. So I've labeled the lines of equal potential energy. Okay, oh, now then, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the leakage under the dam. Q is equal to, there's an equation for the back, I've written down here, the discharge in cubic feet per second or whatever units permeability are, uh, is N sub Q divided by N sub D. N sub D is 10. N sub Q is uh, 3 or 4, and uh, in this case it's 3. H is the head loss. Uh, M uh, there's, one, uh, there's one meter, I mean there's 100 centimeters per meter, and there's one meter per meter, just to get the units to come out. I want the units to come out cubic meters per meter per second. So I put 3 divided by 10 times 6.3, 3.5, 10 to the minus 4, 1 over 100, and I get uh, 7.000007 meters per cubic meter per second. Okay? Now then, if the water flows through this dam too fast, this sand or the soil will wash out downstream. So I need to calculate the exit gradient. The energy loss in this last square, the, the critical square is the last small, is the smallest square, the last smallest square. It's the smallest square that the water leaves to, leaves out from under the project and goes out into the downstream reservoir. So this is the smallest square that the water is going to exit on its way out from under the soil. Now then, I'm saying that that square, the length of that square, is one point, I'm saying it's 1.1 meters. Okay? I measured it. The length of the square is 1.1 meters. I'm losing 0 0.63 meters uh, in feet of energy due to friction as water flows through here. So the exit gradient is the energy loss, 0 0.63 meters divided by 1.1 meters, which gives me uh, 0 0.57 meters for me, that's the exit gradient. That's the actual ex exit gradient. I need to know the critical gradient. The critical gradient can be computed by taking the specific gravity, which is normally about 2.7 minus 1, which gives you 1.7, divided by 1 plus the void ratio of the soil. And so the uh, gradient could be around 1 to 1.75. So we, I usually think of a critical hydraulic gradient being about one. If the actual gradient gives us above one, you're going to wash out. We usually use a safety factor about three or four. Okay? Kill it, man. I've lost some points. I use the flow net to compute the uplift. I thought I was missing a sheet, but I had it here. I just had it in the wrong place. For the completed flow net, compute the flow under the dam per meter dam if the coefficient of permeability is. We've done that, but now I want to compute the uplift pressure. Now then, I'm going to compute the uplift pressure at the point B. The point B has an elevation head of 15.6 meters. See, it's from here to here is 17.2 meters. Down 1.6 meters gives me an elevation energy of 15.6 meters. What is the total energy at the point B? Well, the total energy for this line right here for my flow net was 19.72, so I got 19.72 meters of energy. I got an elevation head of 15.6 meters, so that means I got a pressure head of 4.12 meters. 
and I could do that all across here and, and show you what the uplift pressure would be against the dam. So with this flow net, I can calculate the seepage under the dam. I can calculate the uplift pressure of the dam. I can calculate the critical hydraulic gradient and the actual hydraulic rate to see if the downstream soil is going to wash out and, uh, and I can draw the flow net. And so uh, it's quite a bit that we can do with that, with that flow net. Okay, the next topic that we're going to talk about is how to measure the angle of internal friction. It's called angle of internal friction. It starts out how to determine phi or the angle of internal friction. And the angle of internal friction is zero for saturated clays and silts that are loaded rapidly. Now let's think about this. Let's suppose you got an idea what a clay is, or a silty soil. They're fine grain soils. Clays and silts are fine grain soils. If I were to take a saturated or a very wet clay or a very wet clay or silt, and this clay or silt was underground, and I were to apply a foundation load on top of it, what's going to happen as soon as I apply the load is the water pressure is going to go up. And the total pressure is going to go up. But the effective pressure or the intergranular pressure, the pressure between the soil grains, is going to either remain the same or it's going to go down. And what's going to happen is that increase in load is going to be carried by water pressure, not the soil. This can cause, the high pore pressure can cause the soil to be weaker than you would expect it to be. If you apply a load faster than the pore pressures can dissipate, then the soil is weaker than you anticipate. And so uh, we say here that if you got a, uh, the shear strength of a soil is equal to the cohesion in the soil plus the angle of internal friction. If the uh, uh, plus the, uh, the shear strength of the soil is equal to cohesion plus the, the effective pressure times the angle, the tangent of the angle of the internal friction. Now, if the effective pressure is zero or very nearly zero, then you would have zero friction in the soil. So the only strength you'd have in a clay would be the cohesion. So we say the angle of friction is zero for saturated clays and cells loaded rapidly. Because almost always by rapid, we mean that they're loaded quicker or faster than the pore pressure can go to zero when you increase the load. The angle of internal friction is determined by measuring the slope from more circles from triaxial tests on sands, gravel, silts, and clays. We have a consolidated drain triaxial test, a consolidated undrained triaxial test, and he's got a little bit about that in the book, and you can read that. The angle of internal friction is determined by the standard penetration test for sands and gravels. This is where you take a 140-pound hammer and you drive a standard tool and you record that it takes maybe 20 blows to drive a standard tool one foot into a uh, into a sand or or gravel, and that would be the standard penetration test. Okay, here's a here's an example. We got a split spoon. We're going to drive it. So at a depth of 12 to 12 and a half feet, it took eight blows to drive this thing one foot. From 12 and a half feet to 13 foot, it took, took 11 blows to drive it a foot. Uh, you say, well, how did, it, how did it take 11 blows to drive it a foot <laughs> when you only drove it half a foot? Uh, and that's a good question. Uh, he calculated how much it would take to drive it, and uh, and reported. He probably measured the blows that it would take it to drive it six inches and doubled it. Okay. He probably took he probably took a I'm sorry. It took him eight blows to drive it a half foot. It took eleven blows to drive it another half foot and it took thirteen blows to drive it the last half foot. What we normally do is take the last two measurements, add those up so the blows per foot is 24. We add the 11 and 13, and we get 24 blows per foot. Okay? Now, right, going on. Uh, I just wanted to show you that. That's uh, 
Uh, that's uh, the standard penetration test. There is a graph that we will run into in a few minutes when we get to uh, another section that will show you the relationship between the blows per foot on the standard penetration test and the angle of internal friction. So let me set this aside temporarily and, uh, and let's go to uh, uh, poor pressure, effective stress, and total stress. It's called effective stress number one. Okay. Okay. Imagine a column of soil. Here's the soil surface. And let's imagine that we have this is drawing of, of something that's maybe one square foot. I'm just drawing two dimensional. He's got three dimensions. It's one foot, one foot, and of course I don't know how deep it is. So we've got one square foot here. And this soil is here. And I want to know the soil pressure acting down at this point. Well, the soil pressure is equal to the total weight of that column of soil divided by the area of one square foot. And so uh, uh, that's the point he's trying to get across here. We've got a moist soil here, we've got a water table here, and we've got saturated soil down here. And we want to be able to find in the pore pressure, the effective stress, and the total stress. Go to sheet uh, two, and he says the total vertical stress is determined by summing the products of the unit weights times the uh, layer thickness. So I, I want to draw a little problem here. Let's suppose here's the surface. And let's say that I've got a damp soil down to about 10 feet. Here's the ground surface at zero up going down 10 feet. And let's say the soil weighs, uh, the wet unit weight is 120 pounds per cubic foot. And I got 10 foot of soil. So I got 10 feet of soil that weighs 120 pounds per cubic foot. So I've got a, a total vertical stress of 10 feet times 120 pounds per cubic foot, which is equal to 1,200 pounds per square foot. You cut it. Point. That's the total stress. The uh, uh, sheet three talks about uh, the effective stress. On sheet two, the uh, pore water pressure is determined by the density of water by the distance that you're below the water table. So again, let me make up a little problem here. Let's suppose that here's the soil surface. And let's suppose I want to know the total stress at this point down here. That's uh, so let's say 20 feet below the surface. I want to know the total stress down here. I want to know the pore pressure, and I want to know the effective stress at this point, 20 feet deep. Let's suppose the water table is right here, and that's five feet below the surface. That means that my point down here is 15 feet below the water table. The pore pressure, which is called U, is equal to the depth of the water, H sub W. It's equal to H sub W times the unit weight of water. Now then, in this case, U is equal to 15 feet. There's 15 feet of water standing above my point and water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So I could multiply that out. That would be then the head. That would be the pore pressure. What would be the uh, total pressure down here, the total vertical pressure? Let's say this soil has a wet unit weight of 120 pounds per cubic foot. Let's say the soil below the water table has a wet unit weight, which is equal to the saturated unit weight of 130 pounds per cubic foot. What's the total pressure? 
that's sigma of V. Well, I've got five feet times 120 plus 15 feet times 130, and I can work that out. Now, what is the effective pressure? Well, the effective pressure is the difference between the two, but I can calculate it directly, and I'm going to calculate it right now. And so the effective pressure, sigma bar V, is equal to the soil above the effective pressure and the total pressure are the same if I'm above the water table. So here's sigma bar V. And so it's equal to, for the top five feet, I got five feet of soil that weighs 120 pounds. It turns out to be 600 pounds per square foot. So the effective pressure and the total pressure are the same for the soil above the water table because there's no pore pressure, okay? And then I've got 15 feet of soil that weighs, saturated weight of 130, but the buoyant weight is 130 minus 62.4. And I would get a number. Turns out if you work this number, you work this number, and I take this number and subtract that from it, I would get this number. But you can calculate it directly. And that's shown on sheet two and sheet three. And there's uh, some example problems. And, uh, and you can find that. K shows, this is K at rest, shows the ratio of the lateral pressure to the vertical pressure. If I'm at a point, if I'm at a point 10 feet below the water table, then I've got the pore pressure is equal to 624 pounds per square foot. According to Pascal's law, water pressure is equal in all directions. So the horizontal pore pressure is the same as the vertical pore pressure. The upward pore pressure is the same as the vertical pore, the downward pore pressure. But the soil pressure is not equal in all directions. And so K gives the ratio of the horizontal component of the pressure to the vertical component. And this is probably K sub O, the earth pressure at rest. And so it is saying is if the vertical pressure, effective pressure was 1,000 and K is 4, then 1,000 times 0.4 would be 400. The horizontal component would be 400 pounds per square foot. And that would be the horizontal component of the effective pressure. If you don't multiply K times the total pressure, because the total pressure has a pore pressure component, a water component, and effective pressure, this K only applies, only applies to the effective pressure. K only applies to the effective pressure. Okay. And there's some examples that you can follow. And, uh, and I will leave you to follow those examples. Let's go to the next topic. which would be, uh, uh, let's, let's do a, uh, let's do a, a landfill problem right quick. It's just a one page problem, a landfill problem. This is a nifty little problem. And, uh, and I believe I've seen a problem like this on the exam, but it wasn't a landfill problem. It was just a construction problem. But, uh, but it's uh, applicable to a landfill. A landfill is going to be constructed at a site with a confined aquifer at a depth of 80 feet below the surface. The piezometric surface rises to within 20 feet of the surface. What is the maximum depth that the excavation could be made if no credit is given for the weight of the solid waste in the landfill? Now then, let me, uh, let me uh, take a clean sheet of paper and uh, maybe you can draw on the back of a uh, sheet of paper. And let me just draw you a sketch. And you can draw your sketch right up here. But I've been missing the last few minutes. I'm going to put the sketch where you can see it. Here's the ground surface. And I've got a soil. And uh, there's an aquifer down at a depth of 80 feet. So down here at 80 feet, there's a sand, let's say, with water in it. That water is under pressure. So here's the ground surface. This is 80 feet. That Water is under a, enough, uh, so this is an aquifer, water-bearing formation. If I were to put a 
monitoring well or a piezometer or a glass tube, water would rise to within 20 feet of the soil surface. That means I got water pressure pushing up here. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to dig a hole. A big old hole. And I'm just going to pick this element of the soil right here. So what I've got is this soil mass right here. I've got the original surface at zero. I got this hole. I'm going to dig the hole and before I put garbage in it, I've got water pressure acting up against this block of soil. So here's this block of soil. And here's my aquifer. And I've got pressure pushing up against that soil. Well, I'm going to express the pressure as potential energy, and I'm going to express it as feet of head. How many feet of head do I have pushing up against the bottom of this thing here? If this is 20 feet, this is 80 feet, what is that dimension? It's 60 feet. So I got 60 feet of head. pushing up. Okay? What do I have pushing down? Well, if I don't want to have a lot of fun, I better have as much head pushing down as I got pushing up, right? So what I need is the equivalent of 60 feet of head pushing down. What's going to provide that? It's going to be the weight of the soil. Water weighs around 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Soil weighs around 130 pounds per cubic foot. <coughs> so soil provides two feet of head for every foot of depth. Water provides one foot of head for every foot of depth. So what I need is the equivalent of 60 feet of water pushing down. I can get that with 30 feet of soil. So I got to leave 30 feet of soil here. So how deep can I dig the hole? It's 80 feet. I've got to leave 30 so I can dig the hole 50 feet. What would happen if I dug deeper than that and if my measurements were true? The water pressure pushing up would exceed the pressure pushing down and the bottom would uh, come up and the hole would fill with water. If I had a scraper and a scraper operator down there, he'd have to unfasten his seatbelt and swim for his life. You could visualize standing there at the end of the day. This guy did this your scrapers down there. You got to explain to the battalion commander why your scrapers under 50 feet or for 30 feet of water. And you're standing there saying things cannot get any worse. That scraper's down. Fortunately, the operator swam out. The scraper's still there. You're standing there and a stranger comes up and he stands beside you. And you're thinking things can't get any worse. About that time, a glob of oil and gasoline comes up spreads across the surface and the stranger introduces himself as an inspector from the TNRCC, the Texas Natural Resource Recovery Commission, or Texas Natural Resource Conservation Commission, and he says, what are you going to do about that illegal spill of gasoline and oil in the public waters of the United States? And sure enough, things can get worse. Anyway, anyway that problem has worked out. And there it is. You can follow that. And, and that's a good uh, geotechnical problem that sometimes is on the exam. Although they usually give it as a construction problem, not a landfill problem. I wouldn't be surprised to see it as a landfill problem one of these days. Okay, now let's go to a... Let's go to a... To a... The foundation... Let's go to the one that's called foundation, and it's uh, Chizagi Meyerhoff equation. And uh, so the Chizagi Meyerhoff equation is given in your textbook, and it says that the gross uh, weight that this soil will carry, the gross pressure that the soil will carry, has a friction term, a cohesion term, and a surcharge term. It has term one, term two, and term three. And, uh, and, of course, the friction term is one-half gamma times B times N sub gamma. Uh, rho G is the gross or ultimate bearing capacity. If you go to sheet two, 
it describes these terms. And so I'm going to try to leave the equation up here where you can see the equation. And I will put the friction term, the first term. And I changed it slightly. It just says gamma in your book, but I changed it to gamma 2. And that's the effective unit weight of the soil below the base of the footing. So again, we have a, a sketch. Maybe here's, maybe here is a foundation. Here's the original ground surface. Here's the depth of the footing below the ground. And you got the soil that's below the footing. That's gamma 2. You got the soil that's above the base of the footing. That's gamma 1, and that's in term 3, which we'll find in a few minutes. So gamma 2 is the effect of the soil below the base of the footing. B is the least dimension of the footing. The footing might be B feet wide and L feet long. It might be a footing with a length of 10 foot, width of 5 feet, and a depth of maybe 6 feet. Okay? N sub gamma is the Tezaga bearing capacity due to friction in the soil below the footing. So that's the friction term in the soil below the footing. Okay, C is the cohesion term. C is the cohesion of the soil. N sub C is the Tezaga bearing capacity due to cohesion. That should be C O H E S I O N. Okay? You notice there's nothing in there about the dimension of the foundation. Go to the next sheet, 1C, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a surcharge, and we need to change this symbol. Uh, this is in your book, but this symbol looks mighty similar to that one. But this is the surcharge, and I think this is Q. This is a Q. Which is different. This is rho Q, and this is this. I mean, this is a P Q, and this is P G. So the equation in the book is correct. I typed it wrong here. So this is P Q. That's the surface surcharge. Suppose I had a foundation that was underground like this, where the depth of footing was that, but I had some uh, potash stacked up here, exerting a surcharge pressure on this. That would make my footing stronger. So if I know that surcharge, I can put it in. Okay. This is the surcharge term, and this is the weight of that soil above the footing, but below the soil surface. That's that unit weight times d sub f. That makes my foundation stronger. That surcharge makes it stronger. And multiplied times n sub q, which is the Tezagi bearing capacity due to surcharge. So let's jump into evaluating some of these. So if I go to sheet, uh, I believe it's uh, sheet D, there's a, a graph showing the relationship between the angle of internal friction and the bearing capacity factor. So if I want to design this footing, I need to know the cohesion of the soil, and I need to know the angle of internal friction for the soil. So right now, let's assume we know them. We'll get back to how you determine them in a minute. But in many of the problems that they give you, they give you the cohesion and they give you the angle of friction. This is a graphical solution, so if I knew the angle of friction, I could determine n sub c, n sub q, or n sub gamma. But that normally isn't the way we do it. This is given in your book, but they also give you a table. And that table is on page uh, 1F, I believe. Yes, 1F. So look at 1F. 1F is the Tezagi bearing capacity factors for general shear. Knowing the angle of internal friction, you can find N sub C, N sub Q, and N sub gamma. And of course, you can interpolate if you had 12 degrees or 26 degrees, you could interpolate. You could also use that graph and read it directly. I imagine you'd probably be a little more accurate to interpolate off this graph. Okay? Now then. I said, well, I'll go imagine we had a foundation, and maybe the foundation had a, a length of uh, 12 feet and a width of, of uh, 6 feet. Uh, there are some adjustments that you have to make to these uh, coefficients because of the shape factor. If you will look at uh, sketch 1E, uh, e, uh, yeah, one, uh, e, uh, there's table 10-2, which shows a, bear, a, a correction factor. If you have a square footing, or a B over L. Let's suppose I had a footing where L is 12 and B is 6. Then B over L is equal to 0 0.5. So I got a square footing. 
I got a rectangular footing with V over L of 0 0.5. I got a V over L of 0.2. I got a V over L of 0. That would be an infinitely long footing. Or I got a circular footing, and there's a multiplier. So when I look up N sub C on the curve or on the table, I got a correct N sub C for a shape factor. And you get the shape factor off table 10 too. Okay? When I look up N gamma off table 10 3, there's also a correction for the shape factor here. That's on table 10 4 for B over L for square, for 1 for a circular, for a B over L of 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and 0, infinitely long. So here's the multiplier. All of these corrections, these two corrections, are multiplier. You notice that there was a correction for N C and there was a correction for N gamma but there was no correction for NQ. There is no correction for NQ. There is a correction for NC, and there's a correction for N gamma. Okay? Now let's go to sheet uh, uh, foundation two. Foundations of special cases. A special case would be to put the foundation on the surface. If you put the foundation on the surface, there is no third term. So all that's zero. There's no surcharge. Make a very good foundation. Makes it an easy computation. Okay? Uh, you get added strength foundation if you put it below ground. But a special case would be one on the surface. You can put a footing on sand. If you put it on sand, there's no cohesion. Sand is a cohesionless material. So if you put a foundation on the sand... Uh, on the surface, there'd be no second term and no third term. Now, if you could just make the sand frictionless, there'd be no term, right? It wouldn't carry anything. A footing on saturated clay with a load applied rapidly or a wet sand with a load, I mean, a wet clay with a load applied rapidly. And what I mean by rapidly is applied normally. If you use the normal construction techniques that we use in the United States and we're talking about a clay that's wet, the drainage from that clay is so slow that all construction is rapid. And so a footing on a saturated clay or a wet clay with a load applied rapidly, there's no friction, there's no term one. If it's on the surface, there's no term three. Now then, how would we determine C? There's a test called the unconfined compression test. What you do is you take a cylinder of soil, you put it in a testing machine, and you find the load P, the maximum load P that it will cover. If you were recording the load versus the strain on that saw, which we don't usually do, uh, the load would go up and it would come down. You'd get the maximum load P divided by the original area. So it'd be the P max divided by the original area. And that gives you an engineering stress. And that's the unconfined compressive strength. The unconfined compressive strength. So the unconfined compressive strength is equal to P max divided by A sub O. Now then, uh, I'm going to move this just slightly to get a little room here. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Now when I run this unconfined compressive strength, if, I, if you remember Moore's circle, which I don't want to take a lot of time to review, but I am going to use it briefly. On this, the unconfined compressive stress, there was zero stress out here on the outside, just atmospheric pressure. But there was nothing over atmospheric. So we had, we had zero pressure on the side, and we had the pressure caused by P on the surface. So the unconfined compressive strength, if I plot plus shearing stress up this way, minus shearing stress down this way, plus normal stress this way, minus normal stress that way, and I call compression positive, the unconfined compressive strength was applied. There's no shearing stress, so it plots out right there. So there is the unconfined compressive stress. The lateral stress is zero, so it plots right there, zero, zero, zero. I can draw more circle and that's supposed to be a circle. And the cohesion 
I'm sorry, the uh, the envelope of failure, I'm assuming, is a horizontal line, and the cohesion is that distance right there. Cohesion is that distance right there. That cohesion is the radius. The radius is half the diameter. The diameter is the difference from zero to the unconfined compressive strength. So C is equal to one half the unconfined Q sub U, one half the unconfined compressive strength. C is the unconfined compressive strength divided by two. That comes from Moore's circle. So these are some special cases. Okay. Now then going on to sheet uh, three, uh, let's worry about designing a foundation on clay for a general shear failure. I'm going to use the Terzaghi equation. There it is right up there. I'm going to use table 10.3 to find NC, NQ, and N gamma. And I'm going to correct NC and N gamma for B and L. And I, if the water table is located near the footing, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to make the appropriate adjustments. And I'm going to explain what I mean by is the water table near the footing. Uh, I'm going to use the appropriate factor, sa a factor of safety or a load factor. The safety factor is generally three for average conditions, usually two for improbable combinations. You know, if I'm designing for the hundred, uh, the worst wind of the century, and uh, earthquake, and a big snowstorm all occurring at the same time, I probably use a safety factor of two. So that's not very likely to happen. Okay. Going on to sheet uh, four, my example one, I got angle of internal friction. I have determined to be 25 degrees. If the proposed foundation is six foot wide by 12 foot long. B over L is 6 over 12, which is 0.5. What is N gamma? N gamma, going back to, uh, to table 10.3 uh, for uh, 25 degrees. Here's 25 degrees. N gamma is 9.7. So N gamma is 9.7. And that's N gamma. But I got to adjust n gamma for the uh, for the uh, shape factor. The shape factor is uh, 0.5, so my multiplier is 0.9. So it's 9.7 times 0.9, which is 8.7. This came out of table 10.3. This came out of table 10.4. The next one I won't bother getting tables, but I could look up. For 25 degrees, I can find from table 10.3 that NC is 25.1. From table 10.2, I can find that my correction factor multiplier is 1.12 for B over L equal to 0.5. So that gives me 28.1. NQ is equal to 12.7. There is no correction. If you want to make it, it's times 1, right? And uh, so I get 12.7. Going to uh, sheet 5. Uh, the foundation, the, the gross pressure that I can carry is term one plus term two plus term two, two, three. I'm going to use a saturated clay on this problem. That was just an example. Here's another problem. This is another problem. Foundation on the surface of saturated clay with the load applied rapidly to the water table at the surface. It's a saturated clay, so there's no term one. It's on the surface, so there's no term two. But I do need C. If so, I look for C, it's corrected for B over L. Uh, there's no correction factor that I can make in term two. Let's look at term two. All term two is C times N sub C. There's no gamma in it. You don't have to make a water correction for the water table for term, for the C term, the cohesion term. The water table doesn't affect C. It might affect the strength of the soil but the buoyant forces don't have anything to do with the cohesion. Okay? So uh, let's uh, go on. The B over L correction varies from a low. The B over L fraction varies from a low of 1 for a long beam to about a high of 1.25 for a square. So I'm going to make the correction later. But the correction varies from about 1 to 1.25. So remember that. The angle of internal friction is zero for this clay. Therefore, if I look in that uh, uh, table 10.3, I would find that N sub C for angle of internal friction is zero is 5.7. So S and C, the unconfined compressive strength, 
uh, is is here, and so C is half the unconfined compressive strength. This symbol is what you they use in the book. Uh, and uh, so now the rho, the gross pressure is C times N C, and C is the unconfined compressive strength divided by two. Rho net is equal to rho gross minus the depth of the footing, the depth of footing times you weigh the soil. Our foundation is on the surface. This is equation 10-2 in your book. But gamma d sub f is zero because the foundation is on the surface. Therefore, rho net is equal to rho gross, which is equal to n sub c, which is equal to 5.7 times the unconfined compressive strength divided by two. So the allowable load here, the allowable stress, would be uh, this divided by a safety factor. And I'm going to let the factor safety factor equal 3, so the allowable load would be equal to 5.7. Let me write this way, 5.7 times the unconfined compressive strength divided by 2 and divided by 3, and that's equal to about 0 0.95 times SNC. Now remember there was a correction that varied from 1 to 1 1.25. Well, if you take 0.95 and multiply it by a constant that could be around 1 to 1 1.25, this comes out, if you're not real scientific, this comes out around 1. What this is saying is that the allowable load on a saturated clay where you apply the load rapidly and the footing is on the surface, and you want to use a safety factor of three, the allowable stress is about equal to the unconfined compressive strength. And you can stay up all night and memorize that, and forever then, if you were designing a foundation on the surface, it can be rapidly loaded on a saturated clay with a safety factor of three, what's your allowable bearing capacity? It's about equal to the unconfined compressive strength of the soil. That's pretty handy to remember. If you were if you were unloading a uh, if you were unloading a uh, several railroad cars of brick on the side of the, uh, the railroad siding, and you had a saturated clay, and you said, "Holy smoke! I got to stack this stuff up." But I wonder how high I can stack it. If I stack it too high, I'm going to get a foundation failure. So here's the ground surface. You could go out there and. And, and here's the, you know, this is B. Maybe you're going to stack this thing so your stack is 10 foot wide, and you're going to stack, you want to stack those bricks so they're about uh, 10 foot high. You got a tall battalion, and they can stack them up 10 foot high. And you say, I wonder if it would carry it. Well, what you can carry with a safety factor of three is equal to the unconfined compressive strength of the soil. Let's say that unconfined compressive strength is a thousand pounds per square foot. You got brick that weighs a hundred and uh, 50 pounds per cubic foot. You're going to stack it 10 foot high, so you're trying to put 1,500 pounds on something that will only carry 1,000 pounds with a safety factor of three. Now, you can stack them there, but you won't have a safety factor of three. I don't know if you want to do that or not, but, but that's a nice practical thing to remember. Okay, going on to uh, sheet uh, six, uh, uh, 5C, I'm sorry, 5C. Uh, you can make this DOL correction, and that comes out 9.5 to 1.19. And I'm saying 0.95 to 1.19 among gentlemen like you is about 1, right? Certainly is for me, okay? Now, a square foundation on a saturated clay, load applied rapidly, foundation on the surface. You can work that. We've already worked it. If we know the unconfined compressive strength, the unconfined compressive strength is eight tenths of a ton per square foot. We can carry about eight tenths of a ton per square foot with a safety factor of three. Now, when you put that little adjustment in there, it might be a little higher or a little lower. So you can go through that example. Several pages. Keep following. Now, in rectangular foundation on saturated clay, low apply or load applied rapidly, foundation at a depth. In this case. We're still not going to have the first term, but we are going to have the second term like we did a while ago, but we're going to have the third term now because the footing is, uh, is five feet below the soil. we got a footing like this with it five feet below the soil surface. And uh, 
So let's uh, work it. Uh, it turned out, uh, looks like I didn't end up with it uh, written on here. Uh, I don't know why it didn't come out. But what we got is P gross is equal to C times NC plus gamma D sub F times N Q. So we got the angle of internal friction is equal to zero degrees, and we got the uh, uh, unit weight of the soil, gamma wet of the soil is uh, 122.4 pounds per cubic foot, and we got uh, the unconfined compressive strength is equal to one kip per square foot. So what is C? C is equal to one half of one kip per square foot. So the gross pressure this thing will carry is 500 pounds per square foot times N sub C. And N sub C was uh, is uh, one, uh, for an angle of internal friction of zero is equal to 5.7. Got that from table 10.3. Plus the unit weight of the soil, which is 122.4, but it's saturated. This is the third term. I said the water table was at the surface. Water table is at the surface, so I got to subtract 62.4, okay, times NQ, and NQ is equal to one for angle of internal friction equal to zero. So this turns out to be uh, 60 times 1. So I can carry 500 times 5.7. So that's 0, 0, 0.0. That's 2850, the first term, plus the second term, which is uh, 60. So that turns out to be 2910 pounds per square foot. That's the gross pressure. The net pressure is equal to 2910 minus this uh, 122, uh, 60 times one, uh, uh, minus 60. It's equal to uh, the net, as I just subtract, d sub f times the effective weight of the soil. So that's minus 60 again, which puts me right back to uh, 2850. So in the case of a clay foundation, you don't get any increase due to depth if you're below the water table. If you're above the water table, uh, you would get an increase due to putting the footing uh, at depth. And so you can work that out. Okay. Uh, in your book, uh, they show you how to adjust uh, footings because you got a moment. And and I, I've seen a problem like this on the quiz. And so this is worth working. And, and, and they, uh, he has some good examples in the book. But it's, it's kind of easy to get mixed up. So I want to go through this a little bit. We got moments on a footing. And, uh, and what you do if you got a moment on a footing, if you remember your mechanics and materials, you could, if you had a a direct load P, uh, the stress, if you had a block with a load P, you got a block here. With a load P, it's off center, so you got a moment and you got a load. The stress, and there's P over A plus or minus MC over I. And you can always approach the problem that way. But in your book, he chose not to approach it that way. And, uh, and it's a pretty simple way to do it, the way he does it using tables. So I, you know, if you're not really sharp on your mechanics and materials, you might be better off using the way that he's doing in his book. Forget about this P over A plus or minus MC over I and follow the procedure that he has here. This procedure, if a moment is exerted on a footing, the values of B and L are adjusted and he acts like there's no moment. So he takes the moment value and he adjusts the dimensions of B over L. And then you design it as if it was a regular foundation without uh, any moment. 
So in equation 10-1, use the adjusted value, and equation 10-1 is this Meyerhoff equation. And so you notice it's got a B term. So it says in equation 10-1, use the adjusted value of B in term 1. So here you would use the adjusted value of B if there's a moment. It says you would use the real values of B and L, not the adjusted values, but the real values of B and L in table 10-2 and 10-4. That's to get the adjustment factor. So if uh, B and L is a 6 and 12, so B over L is 0 0.5, you use the real values to come up with the adjustment factors. You use the real value of B in table 10-3. Uh, you use the adjusted values of B over L in the following equation. Here it is. It's this equation in your book. So the P is equal to the load P is equal to P allowable times the adjusted value of B times the adjusted value of L. In other words, if we had a footing that was 6 feet by 12 feet and we adjusted, uh, let's say there was a moment about this axis but no moment about the other axis, then we wouldn't adjust the 6. We're still going to have an adjusted foundation 6 foot, but maybe this comes out 10 foot. The adjusted value is 10 feet. Well, then the area is 60 square feet. What he's saying is the adjusted area times the allowable stress gives you the total load that you could carry. And so that's pretty simple, pretty simple approach. Going on, let's see how we make the adjustment. Uh, he says you adjust B, you got B and you got L. You would adjust B. Here's B and here's L. If you have a moment about this axis where the load is off center this way, you would adjust L. If this is the axis and you had a load off this axis out here somewhere, you would have to adjust B. So you adjust B, you got uh, a P of 2,000 pounds, you got a moment to adjust B of 1,000 foot pounds. B is equal to 4 feet, uh, so the adjustment of B is equal to MB divided by P, that's 1,000 foot pounds divided by 2,000, and, uh, and that gives you 0.5. So B is equal to uh, the B adjust is equal to B minus 2 times the adjustment of B, which is uh, a half foot. So 2 times the adjustment of B is equal to 4 times 2 times 5 is 1. So you get adjusted value for B of 3 feet. And you can go through the adjustment of L. And he's got some example problems in the book. I think once you catch on what he's doing, what he wants you to do is to adjust B and L so that you come up with a decreased area and what he's saying is you got to carry less stress. And you would find the same thing if you found P over A and you found MC over I. When you combine these, you'd find an adjustable stress, an adjusted stress that might look like this using MC over I and P over A. And you've got to make your total stress less than the ultimate stress, so you'll have failure. And so he chooses to to adjust B and L, come up with an adjusted area, multiply it times the allowable stress. Since the area is reduced, he gives you, he's really reducing the allowable stress, in a sense. Okay. Here's a sketch, 10-5, that goes, it's in your book, it's directly out of your textbook. Okay. Now then, let's go to another topic. Let's go to uh, let's go let's go to a, a, a group of problems uh, marked uh, change in stress at a depth due to uh, foundation load or a square foundation. And this is kind of important. Uh, this, if they give any consolidation problems, you're going to have to do this. And I've got this handout to help you do it. But I messed up by not giving you one sheet that was in your book. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to project it on the screen from my book. From my book, and then what you'll have to do is get your book, and you can look at the uh, information in your book and make sense out of this. I'm sorry I did. I just forgot to Xerox. Somehow I forgot to Xerox that that sheet. And that sheet is in the appendix uh, at the end of the foundation design. It's back on page. It's back on page. Uh, back on page uh, 1025. So let me. Project 1025, and I'll work on top of this. There's 1025, and it's Appendix C, Boussinet Stress Contour Charts for Infinitely Long and Square Footings. Uh, this is a square footing. This is infinitely long. Uh, there's another one uh, on the next page that's for circular footings. So the circular footings would be on the next page. The square footings would be on this page. Uh, the rectangular footings aren't there. You could kind of maybe take an average. Uh, there's another technique which I did make a copy of and demonstrate that's in the handout for handing, handling the rectangular footings. Uh, now then, uh, let me go to stress at depth sheet number one. Change in stress at a depth due to a foundation load square footing. We're going to use this in working consolidation problems. We got a foundation that has B equals 10 feet. It's, it's, a, it's a square foundation with B equal to 10 feet. Okay? It has a uniform load of 3,000 pounds, including the weight of the footing uh, per square foot. I mean, 3,000 pounds per square foot. What is the change in stress under the center at a depth of 2B under the ground surface? For the foundation on the surface, what I've got is a surface. I've got a square foundation with a load on there of 3,000 pounds per square foot and I want to go under the center at a depth this is the dimension B and I want to go down here to B and I want to find the change in stress at this point due to putting that 3,000 pounds up there so the contact pressure is 3,000 pounds per square foot the depth below the footing is 2 feet and it's at the center, and I want to find the change in stress. So I go to this table for a square foundation. I go directly under the center, and I go down a distance of 2B. So there's 2B, and I would read 1 tenth P. The pressure here is P, so at a distance of 2B under the center, the pressure is dro dropped to a value of 1 tenth. So it's 1 tenth times 1,000, so the change in pressure is 300 pounds per square foot. That's how you use that table. If I want to know the change in pressure under the edge at a distance of 1B, here's the edge. I'd come down under the edge. I'd come down 1B. And that's somewhere between 2 tenths P and, uh, and 3 tenths. So it's between 2 tenths and 3 tenths P. So I guess I'd interpolate that as, as uh, 0.25P. And that's how you would find it. Uh, for an infinitely long, you do it the same way. Uh, similar arrangement on the next page for the circular, circular ones. So now let's go to the second sketch. I'm going to do the same foundation, but I'm going to do something tricky here. i got a foundation in the bottom of a five-foot cut, and the cut is the same size as the foundation. And I'm going to remove the soil. I'm going to leave a hole. I'm going to have a, what I've got is the, the ground. I'm going to leave a cut. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to backfill it with soil. And this might be a foundation. This might be a foundation of a building, not, not just a footing. And so now I'm applying 3,000 pounds here. So the contact pressure is three feet, still 3,000 pounds per square foot. The depth below the footing is 1.5. I want it one point, in this case, I'm at the same depth. Uh, Uh, at the same depth, so since I put the footing lower, the depth below the footing to this point is only 1.5B. 
it's only 1.5b from the bottom of the footing down to the point in question. And so now I've got to look at a, a 1.5b and the change in pressure is uh, about point, uh, looks like about point uh, two, two one. Actually, it looks more like, I said 2.1, I think I misread it. That should be 0 0.19. I read it the wrong direction. So if the change in stress is 3,000 minus 5 feet times the unit weight of soil of 120 pounds, I have, I'm applying a load of 3,000 pounds minus 600 pounds, which is 2,400 pounds. The soil doesn't realize I'm adding 3,000 because I dug up 600 and, re and then replaced it with 3,000, so the net change is 2,400 times 0 0.1, and I can find the change in stress at a point. Doing the same thing, foundation on top of a five-foot fill with B equals 200 feet. Well, basically with a B of five, 200 feet, uh, I'm putting a fill of five feet, which is 600 pounds per square foot. There is no dissipation of that 600 pounds per square foot, so my pressure is you know, now the depth below the footing, since I'm putting the foundation on top of that fill, is 2.5b. 2.5b gives me an increase, uh, gives me a multiplier of about 0.06. So I got 3,000 pounds times 0 0.06 plus 5 feet times 120, which is 600 pounds. And the multiplier is 1. If I got a fill 200 foot wide, there's not going to be any dissipation of stress 10 or 12 feet below the ground. The, the uh, depth divided by the diameter is too small. And so my pressure is 180 plus 600 was 780 pounds per square foot. The fill did more, added more stress than the foundation did, or the basement. Okay. Now there's another way of doing these. And, and, and he has this in your textbook. I'm really surprised they had it. Now they used to have this on the exam. And uh, but I, I thought they'd kind of taken it off, but apparently they haven't. Uh, suppose they give you this Boussinet diagram, and the diagram that you have in your book is just a sketch. The circle has no foundation on it. But I got a foundation that's 20 feet wide and 20 foot long, and I'm adding 3,000 pounds per square foot. And so I and I want to know the change in stress at some depth. I want to know the change in stress at a depth of 20 feet. So I got B of 20, L of 20, adding 3,000 pounds per square foot. And, uh, and I want to know the change in stress at a depth of 20 feet. So I draw this foundation to scale. Here is my scale. This is one unit. My depth is 20 feet. So I let this represent 20 feet. So I draw a square that's 20 feet by 20 feet. So it's going to be that dimension. By that dimension, I want to stress under the center, so I put my drawing directly on top of the center. And then I count the squares under there. And so counting the squares, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, times 2, there's 20. Counting the next ring, there's 20. Counting the next ring, there's 20. And then counting these parts, it ended up being 67 squares. I said, hey, wow, what a deal. It says here the influence value, right down here it says the influence value is 0 0.05. Each square counts 0 0.05 times my original 3,000 pounds per square foot. That's what that's telling me. So zooming back out here, what I've got is the change in stress is 0 0.005, the influence value times 67 squares times 3,000 gives me 1,005 pounds per square foot. Or the multiplier is 0 .005 times 67, which is a, a 0.335. The influence value is 0.335. This is called the Newmark chart. The advantage of the Newmark chart, I mean, I worked a rectangle. I wouldn't have to work a rectangle. I could have worked the rectangle on the other chart. With this problem, though, I can draw something where I had a building shaped like this, which I can't do on a chart. Maybe there's another building over here. And I want to know the change in stress at this point caused by these two buildings. 
I can draw that, superimpose it on top of this new mark chart, count the squares, and I can get the change in stress. So you can work any shape on the new mark chart. And with AutoCAD, you know, you could put this as a, a drawing that was saved inside your AutoCAD, and you could put this on another layer, and you can slide it around anywhere you want to. It's a really nifty, a nifty way to work. Okay. Uh, Next uh, section we're going to look at is called consolidation. So look at consolidation sheet 1A and also get consolidation sheet 1B. And, uh, and I'm going to superimpose these two sheets uh, as best I can here like this. And he's got some information. This illust illustration problem 9-1. Uh, he says assume that Y is equal to 12 feet. So this dimension is 12 feet. Assume that H sub O is equal to 8 feet. Uh, assume that uh, gamma sand, this is the sand, the unit weight of the sand is uh, 135. So gamma sand is equal to 135 pounds per cubic foot and gamma of the clay is equal to 110 pounds per cubic foot. I won't write the units, but 110 pounds per cubic feet. For the uh, clay, the void ratio, E sub O, is equal to 1.20, and the compression index, C sub C, is equal to 0 0.20. The weight of the structure causes a change in stress at this point, at the midpoint in the clay, of uh, 600 delta, it changes the the vertical stress, 600 pounds per square foot. How would he have found that? He would have found it by using the influence chart, just like we did a while ago. He would find the change in stress, draw the foundation or whatever, put the foundation up here and find the change in stress. If you want to get the consolidation of this clay down here, you need the change in stress at the midpoint. Okay? At the midpoint. He found it at the midpoint. That's why he came down to the midpoint. He's using the average of stress in this eight-foot layer. Now, you could break this eight-foot layer into uh, two four-foot layers and find the change in stress in the top four-foot and the bottom four-foot, but uh, we don't usually do that. You just go ahead and take the layer, unless it's too thick. You take that layer, eight-foot, find the change in stress at the midpoint. Uh, I'm explaining this, and, and you could go on and follow the example. I, I think you can uh, follow the example all right. He says that the change in settlement, delta H, is going to be H sub O, which was the original thickness, 8 foot, divided by 1 plus E sub O, 1 plus the original void ratio. So the original void ratio is 1.2 times C sub C, which he gave you, it's 2 tenths, times the log of the vertical stress final minus the log of the vertical stress original. Well, we got to find the vertical stress. What is the original vertical stress at this point? Well, what we want is the original effective stress. So I'm going to get the total stress, and then I'm going to get uh, maybe the uh, 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 well, let's, let's just follow what he did. He found the original uh, vertical stress. He said he had 12 foot of soil that weighed 135 pounds per square foot, pounds per cubic foot, and he had 4 feet of soil that weighed 110, and he came up with 2060. So that's 2,060 pounds per square foot. He had a change in stress of 600. So up here, the final stress is, is, uh, uh, 2660 and the original stress is 2060. So he just plug in the equation and he found the change in settlement, uh, the change, the consolidation I saw was about one inch. He came out point oh eight feet, which is one inch. In this case, he used the total stress equal to the uh, effective stress because he didn't mention a water table. There is no water table. You just got a you just got a clay. 
But he didn't, there's no water table. He didn't say anything about a water table. Had there been a water table up here somewhere, then the effective stress at this point would have been different than the total stress. But we went through that earlier. So you can go back to the effective stress uh, uh, section and learn how to do that. Okay? Now then, once we determine the consolidation caused by loading that soil, uh, he says if the groundwater table is at the soil surface, the soil overburden is due to be submerged, and now he shows you how to do it if the water table is at the surface, and he would work it over and you wouldn't get much settlement. Going on to the next page, 1D, he says if the soils are not fully saturated, generally sufficiently accurate to assume that a submerged effect unit weighs about half its weight when not submerged. And he shows you how to go do that. And you end up with some settlement. You notice you got more settlement, though, when you assume uh, that the water table was up there because that change in stress was a bigger percentage of the original stress. See, we got one inch of settlement. Uh, we got one inch of settlement uh, when the... Uh, when you didn't mention the water table, we got 1.7 inches because the 600 pounds represented a bigger percentage of the original stress. So we ended up with 1062 and 600 and uh, to get 1662. So down here, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the 600 pounds represented a bigger increase in stress over the original stress. Okay, now there's an example problem 9.2 which is basically the same kind of problem. Uh, but here, he worked the problem where the, uh, let's, let's read about the soil. He says that the, uh, the magnitude of the pre-consolidation soil over and pressure is 1,000 pounds per square foot. In other words, you have got to add 1,000 pounds per square foot to this soil before the soil realizes that it's being loaded. You got a flat slope here to, to uh, 1,000. You got a flat slope to 1,000, and then you've got this curve where C sub Z is equal to 0 0.30 beyond 1,000. So you could load this foundation to 1,000 pounds per square foot before the foundation of the soil would know it was even loaded. He explains this in pretty good detail in your book, and we're running out of time. So I think you can work through this example problem is not in your book, but there is an example problem somewhat similar to it in the book. I just gave you another one because this gives people some difficulty. So here's a problem that's worked out in detail, and you can work it, and you can work the example in the book. But what you've got there is you've got two coefficients. You've got one for the, for the soil is already consolidated for a load up to a thousand pounds or close to it, so the flat is the slope is real flat. So when you calculate this uh, a total settlement, this coefficient is smaller, and then you get into the steeper part of the curve, and you you uh, you calculate the uh, consolidation in parts. Okay. And then you're interested in getting the time that it takes for consolidation to take place. So uh, in, in this case, he said uh, he wants to know how long will it take for half, you know, in part A, you calculate the how much settlement you're going to get. One inch. You're going to get two inches. You're going to get one and a half inch. You're going to get a foot, whatever. The question is, how long will it take to get half of it? How long will it take to get 70% of it? You can answer every question except how long will it take to get all of it. How long will it take it all? It'll take infinity, right? Because the curve approaches, it's an isotopic curve. So you can calculate the time it takes to get 90%. You can calculate the time it takes to get 50%. You can calculate the time it takes 10%. But it takes infinity to get 100%. You use this curve. Here's U, the percent consolidation. Here's the time factor, T sub V. And what you've got to do is either calculate U and get T sub V, or you got to calculate T sub V and get U. Now let's look at a problem and see how you might go about that. He says half of the estimated settlement is a U of 50. So in this problem, he gave you a U of 50 because he says how long it take 
for half the settlement to occur. U is 50. Knowing U is 50, you can find that uh, T sub V is 2 tenths. Now, and you got an equation. T is equal to T sub V, and T sub V is 2 tenths times H dr squared. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute divided by C sub V. And he told you C sub V was two tenths square foot per month. So the only problem you have is determining what, uh, what, uh, uh, what this HDR is. If you've got a soil, a clay, that's consolidating, and you've got sand up here, and you've got sand down here, and you're squeezing water out of this formation, then the furthest distance the water has to travel to get out of this formation is half of the thickness. You recall in that problem that that soil was eight foot thick. If you got sand above it, sand below it, the water only has to travel four foot. The water that has to travel the longest distance is at the middle of the formation. It's got to travel four feet. HDR is not the thickness of the clay. It's the length of the drainage path. In this case, the length of the drainage path is eight feet divided by two feet, which is four feet, because it's got sand above and sand below. Now, I suppose you had the clay, and it had sand above and clay below. Now, the length of the drainage path, HDR, or it had a rock. It had impervious rock below. It had something impervious below. Then HDR is the full length. So if you got sand on one side, something impervious on the other side, HDR is equal to H. If you've got this situation, sand above and sand below, HDR is half of H. And that's the only two problems that you're going to run into. And uh, normally they would give you C sub V, and uh, I guess they would really try to see if you know how to get HDR. They're also trying to see if you know how to find T sub V, knowing that you got 50% consolidation. Had you had uh, been trying to work it for 90% consolidation, uh, T sub V would be 0 0.88. And if you were trying to get 10% consolidation, uh, T sub V would be about uh, 0 0.03. Now then, sometimes they give the problem the other way. They would say... Uh, how much consolidation would you get after uh, 10 years, let's say. So in this case, you know the time, it's 10 years, and what you're going to and you know HDR, and you know T sub V, so what you solve for is C sub V. C sub V becomes the unknown. So C sub V is equal to T sub V times HDR squared divided by T. You plug in the time. You know, the question is, how much consolidation will you get after 10 years? So you plug in your 10 years, and you plug in your T sub V and your HDR squared, and you solve for C sub V. Now, knowing C sub V, suppose that C sub V came out uh, 5 tenths. Suppose C sub V, I mean T sub V, oh, come on, oh, excuse me, let's start over. We want to find T sub V. C sub V is given to you. So the equation is T sub V is equal to C sub V. T sub V is equal to C sub V times T divided by H dr squared. So I plug in C sub V, which was given here. I plug in T, that was the 10 years. And I would plug in H dr, which was the 4 feet and I would get T sub V. Suppose T sub V was 5 tenths. Then I'd find that the percent consolidation was about 75%. So I would get 75% of the consolidation after 10 years. If the consolidation was an inch, the total consolidation was an inch, then I would get 3 quarters of an inch after 10 years. And it would take forever to get an inch. And I believe that's about running us out of uh, tape. Is that about right? Yeah. 
So uh, let me just uh, take a few minutes here and kind of talk to you a little bit about the exam. On these geotechnical problems, you just really want to read the problem. And of course, you're allowed reference books. Uh, you want to think about the fact, if they give you a foundation problem, you want to think about the special cases. And, uh, you know, when you're taking the exam, I think they allow you to work the problem. And so, uh, if you can make some assumptions, make some assumptions that make the problem easy for you to solve. One of the assumptions you can make is that the foundation is on the surface. Bang, you don't have term three. <laughs> uh, lots of times they would demand that the foundation be below because they'll give you the depth of footing. If you can, assume that it's on a clay or loaded rapidly. Then you got C, but you don't have the first term. Uh, but think about these things. Uh, generally speaking, when it comes to foundations, uh, I think you ought to be a little cowardly and go ahead and use a big safety factor. Use a safety factor of three. Uh, I, I think I would go ahead and use the shape factors because he gave them. And, and, and apparently, uh, these shape factors are really small. And, and, and sometimes you don't know the cohesion or the angle of internal friction with enough precision to warrant making those little old shape factor corrections. But I suppose since you're taking an exam, you ought to go ahead and make those shape factor corrections to demonstrate that you know how to do it. You know, part of this is a, I mean, it's an exam. And, you're demonstrating your confidence. Now, uh, you could argue that it shows confidence to ignore something that's not important. But I think on an exam, if they say that the cohesion is a thousand, they mean the cohesion is a thousand. If it's a thousand, <laughs> that's a pretty accurate measurement, and that warrants then making the shape factor corrections. If you think in terms of an examination. Uh, your, uh, your textbook that you have, the Civil Engineering Reference Book, the manual on foundations and on soils, I think is real, real good. I, I would uh, take, I would, I went through the book. I gave you examples, for the most part, that aren't in the book. So I would go through and learn how to work all of them that are in your materials. And then you've got some extra problems to work with, uh, with my materials. Uh, there are several ways to work some of these problems. And if you look at some other reference books, they will show you different ways to work the problems. But I think all of the ways that he presented in the book, uh, I wouldn't be embarrassed to use. If I was taking the exam, I'd be perfectly happy to use that. But I would probably, uh, if somebody told me I'd go right now go take the exam in geotechnical, and I wanted to take a reference book, I'd probably take that book and I'd probably use it. I'd kind of forget. I probably wouldn't take some other books. If I was designing something where I'd get paid, I might not use those approaches. But uh, I have some other approaches I'd rather use. But if I wanted one quick reference book on geotechnical, I've looked through this thing and I think it's a really good reference. So I think you ought to be comfortable using it and learn how to work those problems. Now then, what I did when I took the exam, well, there were some problems that I thought uh, were a little impractical for me to work. I said, gee, I might make a mistake working those. And so I kind of wrote those off at the beginning, and I kind of bared down on the ones I was confident I could work. You have some choice in problem selection. If you got some choice, work the ones you think you got a chance to get right. Kind of ignore the ones that you think you're not going to get right. And uh, I don't know what score you make. When I took it back toward the end of the Civil War, when I took the exam, you only had to make a 70. I assume that's still the case. So make a 70. Make an 80 if you can. You make a 100 if you can. <laughs> By all means, make a 70, right? And pass the exam. So anyway, I want to encourage you to use the uh, reference book. I think it's a good one and good luck. And I guess I'll see you in about a week or so. I'll be doing the water, sewage, and solid waste. Thank you.